Welcome to this lecture on isentropic flow with area change. So in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about how changes in area affect the flow properties in a compressible flow. So let's take a look at the screen below here. Uh, so you'll see a picture of the Saturn V rocket. And uh, you see some people, of course, standing here next to the rocket. What I really wanted to focus on in this image were the rocket nozzles right here. And you can see that they're enormous, right? So you look at the diameter of this rocket nozzle compared to a person. So it's a little bit bigger than a person. And what we're going to talk about in today's lecture is really why these rocket nozzles are designed the way they are. You can see, for example, that they're, they're opening outward. The area is getting bigger as you go downstream with these rocket nozzles. Now, from your understanding of incompressible flow dynamics, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You know, so for example, in our analysis of um, our linear momentum equation analysis, we know that to get as much thrust out of the rocket as possible, you'd want the mass flow rate times the velocity of the exhaust coming out of the rocket nozzle. That's kind of coming out this way, velocity of the exhaust and the mass flow rate. You would want that value to be as large as possible, right? So you, you really want, you know, for example, the velocity to be really big. Now, from our analysis of incompressible flows, we know that if you have a converging nozzle, just from uh, conservation of mass, we know that the velocity will increase as the area gets smaller, right? For, for an incompressible flow, from conservation of mass, you get the density times the velocity times the area will remain constant, so we'll call this one. Here's, here's one and here's two. If it's incompressible, the densities cancel out, and you'll see that V2 will equal V1 times A1 over A2, right? So if you decrease the area, uh, you'll see here, so if the area is decreasing, then V2, so if a2 is less than A1, then V2 will be greater than V1, right? So if you want to increase the velocity of the exit for an incompressible flow, you want to decrease the area, and then that should give you ultimately more thrust, right? But if you look at these rocket nozzles, they're designed in the opposite way, that the area is actually increasing. So, so you know, you might ask yourself, what, what's going on? You know, did they design these things wrong? I know a better way to design a Saturn V rocket. Well, unfortunately, no, they didn't design it wrong. Um, you just don't know enough yet to design a better Saturn V rocket. Turns out when you deal with uh, supersonic flows, the way to get the velocity to increase is to actually increase the area. It's very counterintuitive, but we're going to derive that today. So that's really, you know, the motivation for what we're doing today is to just see how the flow changes when you're dealing with subsonic flows, supersonic flows, and you have area changes. So let's go ahead and get straight into the work here. Oh, by the way, uh, if you've never seen a Saturn V in real life, it's, it's, um, it's pretty impressive. It's a huge rocket. And uh, of course, you can see that just from the size of the people next to it. But what I found really interesting is if you, it's, it's like the length of a football field. You know, if you walk along the length, what's really impressive is it's just the very tip that's really the payload for this rocket. Everything else is just fuel tanks and structure to hold the fuel tanks. It's just a lot of fuel that's required to get you to the moon and back. It's, uh, it's very, very impressive. Okay, so anyway, let's do a quick review of what we did in the last lecture. So if you recall in the last lecture, we derived these expressions for, the, at the very top here, this is for 1D steady adiabatic flow of perfect gas, no work other than pressure work. So we got this expression for the stagnation pressure ratio as a, a function of Mach number. So this is the temperature at that Mach number. And then if you brought the flow to rest, this is the temperature you would get. That's called the stagnation temperature. Similarly, if you start with that stagnation temperature and you go all the way to a Mach number of one, sonic conditions, you will get that T star value. And then you can do the same thing for the speed of sound here. So this is the speed of sound at that Mach number. And if you brought the flow to rest, you would get that speed of sound. And then if this is the speed of sound at stagnation conditions, if you go to a Mach number of one, C star would be the speed of sound that you would have there. And then if we make a further assumption that you're dealing with an isentropic flow, which if you take a look at the last video lecture, we, we described why isentropic flow assumptions are a very reasonable one. 
And if you, if you have an isentropic flow, then this is the stagnation pressure ratio and the density, stagnation density ratio. Again, the idea here is if this is the pressure at that Mach number, if you bring the flow to rest, this is the stagnation pressure you would get. And you can still define a stagnation pressure if you, you just imagine, you don't have to bring the flow to rest to define a stagnation pressure. You can just imagine the flow is brought to rest isentropically. And if you do that, this would be the stagnation pressure you would get. Same sort of thing with the density here. This is the density at that Mach number. If you bring the flow to rest, you get that density. And again, this is the sonic pressure, the sonic density. These are the conditions, these, this would be the pressure and density you would have when the Mach number is equal to one. And since we'll use this quantity a lot coming up, I, I put here the sonic pressure ratio for air. So air has a specific heat ratio of 1.4. So P star over P naught, when you plug it into here, when you plug in uh, K equals 1.4 for air into this expression, it comes out to be about a half. That's a number we're going to use uh, quite a bit in the next few lectures. Uh, specifically, the next lecture, you'll see why we really, that's, that's an important number. Okay, so anyway, now what we're going to do is we're going to take into account changes in area. Okay, so where we'll start is conservation of mass for one-dimensional steady flow. And so we know that rho VA equals a constant, um, just straightforward conservation, of, you know, just mass flow rate is equal to a constant. And what we're going to do is take the derivative of that expression, keeping in mind that the density can vary. Uh, of course, the velocity and area can vary. So this is what you get when you take the derivative of that expression and kind of rearrange it. And what we'll do is we'll combine it with Bernoulli's equation. So Bernoulli's equation uh, looks like this in differential form. It's just the linear momentum equation. Uh, there was a, an example, or actually I think maybe I did it in a lecture a long time ago where I derived Bernoulli's equation in differential form, and it looks like this. The gravitational effects have been removed because we're dealing with a gas, so we don't worry about the gravitational effects. This Bernoulli's equation holds whether or not it, the flow is incompressible or compressible. Uh, where the incompressibility or compressibility assumption comes into play is when you integrate this, then if it's, if it's incompressible when you integrate it, then the density can just be a constant. It can be pulled outside the integral. If it's compressible, then you can't pull the density outside the integral. You'd have to keep it in there. But we're not, we don't need to integrate anything at this point. So this is Bernoulli's equation. And then what we'll do is we'll combine uh, those expressions together along with the definition of the speed of sound. So the speed of sound is just dP over dRho, um, that process occurring isentropically. That's the square of the speed of sound. And then the definition of the Mach number. So if you take all those things together, conservation of mass, Bernoulli's equation, speed of sound definition, Mach number, you put them together and kind of do some algebra on it, you'll end up with this expression here. And this is the one that I really want to focus on. Okay, so uh, let's see here. My screen is stuck for a moment. Just give me a second. There we go. Let's try that again. Okay, so that's the expression I really want to focus on for the moment because I want to run through a few scenarios to, you know, just kind of some thought experiments. This expression gives us a way to relate the Mach number, the flow velocity, and the area together. Okay, so let's consider a case when the um, let's consider an, uh, a subsonic case. Okay, so let's consider a case when a Mach number is less than one, and I'm going to look at two scenarios. Uh, for the area. Let me look at a case when the area is decreasing, so the flow is going this way. Okay, so in that case, dA would be less than zero. The, the change in the area is negative. It's getting smaller. The area is getting smaller. So in that case, when you look up here, uh, dA will be negative, right? The area, of course, is always positive, positive areas. That makes sense. So the right-hand side of the equation will be negative. And if you look at the left-hand side, at least the Mach number part, that quantity will also be negative because the Mach number is less than 1. So some number squared that's less than 1 will be, of course, less than 1. Then minus 1, that makes it negative. So that this quantity is negative, dA is negative. That means dV is going to have to be positive, right? So you can sort of see the logic in that. And so what it means is that the flow speeds up. 
right? If you decrease the area for a subsonic flow, the velocity will increase. So velocity increases as area decreases for a subsonic flow. And of course, an incompressible flow is just an extreme case of a subsonic flow. An incompressible flow is one where the Mach number is zero because the speed of sound is infinite uh, in an incompressible flow. So that's just an extreme case here. So if you plug in a Mach number is equal to zero, then of course this quantity in parentheses is just minus one. It's negative. So it's the same idea. So this, this statement here is true whether the flow is incompressible or just subsonic, right? And you can do the opposite case as well. Let's consider the case where the area is opening. In that case, dA is positive. And if you come back up here, so the right-hand side is positive. This quantity in parentheses will still be negative. And so in order for the left-hand side to be positive to match the right-hand side, then dV has to be negative. So dV would be less than zero. So that means the velocity decreases as the area increases for a subsonic flow. Right? So that all makes sense. And then uh, just one last one. Um, if, if uh, dA is zero, that just corresponds to a, an inflection point. Basically, it means the area is not changing. It'd be like a straight pipe, for example, or a section of straight pipe. If dA is zero, then the only way that happens is if dV is zero. It just means the velocity cha doesn't change. So if you have like a straight section of pipe, the velocity will just remain constant in that straight section. Okay. Now let's go ahead and consider what happens when we have a supersonic flow. So Mach number greater than one. Okay, now in this case, let's go ahead and do the uh, decreasing area case. So here dA is again less than zero. So now we come back to our expression here. The right hand side is negative. Now the quantity in parentheses here, the Mach number squared minus one, that's gonna be positive because the Mach number is greater than one. So if the right hand side is negative and this thing is positive, it means dV has to be negative. Right, so now we see that the velocity actually goes down. So if you have a supersonic flow and you, and you decrease the area, the velocity actually starts to go down. It's just the opposite of what happens for a subsonic flow. So velocity decreases as the area decreases for a supersonic flow. Just the opposite behavior. And then if we look at the other case where we increase the area, here the dA is positive. Area is increasing as we go downstream. And again, if you come up here, dA is positive. This quantity is positive. So in order for the left-hand side to be positive, dV also has to be positive. So velocity increases as the area increases for a supersonic flow. Again, it's just the opposite of what happens for a subsonic flow. So very different behavior whether you're dealing with subsonic or supersonic flows. This is why they make rocket nozzles with the area opening up. In, in the rocket nozzle, the exhaust flow is supersonic. It's, it, uh, we'll talk about how you get to supersonic speeds in just a moment, but the exit flow is supersonic. They want to get as much thrust out of the, the rocket as possible. Let me go back to that picture. They want to get as much thrust out of that rocket as possible. So they want the M dot uh, times the velocity of the exhaust to be as big as they can get it, meaning that they want the velocity be, to be very large. So you, they increase the area because the flow there is supersonic. And to get a higher velocity, you increase the area. Now you might ask yourself, well, why don't they make the, the nozzles even bigger? You know, make it make the area huge as you come out. Well, there you have some engineering trade-offs because you could make the area bigger, um, but then you have more structure that you have to carry around. 
And so, you know, you pay a weight penalty. It's just, it's just not worth it from an, an engineering systems perspective. But certainly if you made the area bigger, you would also get um, a higher velocity coming out of it. So anyway, that's why you have um, these large uh, opening areas when you have, uh, you know, on a, on a rocket nozzle is because they're trying to increase the velocity as much as they can. And if it's a supersonic flow, you want to increase the area. And really, to, to prove that, what we did is we just combined all of these expressions together to uh, relate. Uh, you know, it's just a conservation of mass statement with some other sub quantities put in there. Okay, let me now talk about one other special case. What happens when the Mach number is 1? We've talked about subsonic flows and supersonic flows. Now let's talk about a sonic flow, right? Because that might be kind of interesting since the flow behavior changes quite a bit, whether it's subsonic or supersonic. You might ask yourself, well, what happens right in the middle when it's sonic? So when the Mach number is 1, you'll see that the left-hand side is zero, which means that the right-hand side will have to be zero. So that just will occur when dA is dA must be zero, which means that it's a point of an inflection. The, the area doesn't change. Okay, let me erase that. It means that the, that, uh, the area is not going to change where you have sonic conditions. Okay, so what kind of cases does that correspond to? Well, you could have a situation like this where the area occurs at a minimum it's like an inflection point right so right here the da is equal to zero or you could have something like this where the area is a maximum flow comes in right there da is equal to zero so it could be something like that you could also have something like this um, So like, you know, right, right here, dA is zero. It's just, a, I didn't do a very good job drawing this, but it's basically just kind of a, let me, let me try to redraw that again. That was terrible. Ugh. Okay. It's trying to, the software is trying to help me. Basically, I'm just trying to draw a little flat section in, in the, this nozzle. So there, of course, dA is zero as well. Um, so let's consider some of these cases. Okay, let's see what happens for these cases. Let me, uh, let me focus first on this middle one, okay, where the um, area is the maximum. Let's see what happens. So let's imagine we have a subsonic flow coming in. Okay, so we have subsonic flow coming in and the area is increasing. Right. Well, if, if it's the area is increasing and it's subsonic flow, it's going to be, uh, I'm sorry, this, this case is what we're looking at. It means the velocity is going down. Okay, so velocity is going down. That doesn't get us closer to a Mach number of 1. Um, so by the way, one of the things I should mention, I, I didn't actually write it down here, but I'll just say it in words. Uh, you can see my book style notes if you want to see the proof. But here I've been talking about the velocity going up or down. Um, the Mach numbers behave in the same way. So if, if the velocity is going up here, it means the Mach number is also going up here. If the velocity is going down, the Mach number is going down. You, you can prove that. I just didn't do it here. Um, but if you take a look at my book style notes, the derivation's in there. So anyway, getting back to this example. So if the area is increasing up and uh, upward, so if this is a Mach number that's less than 1, it's subsonic, comes into this case, then what's going to happen is the Mach number is going to decrease. It moves away from a Mach number of 1. So we're not getting closer to a Mach number one. It just it, it won't get there if we have an increasing area. So what ends up happening right at the center here is instead of reaching a Mach number of one, what happens is just the velocity doesn't change. Let me go back up here for a second. If, if dA is equal to zero, let me write this down here. If dA is equal to zero, then we could have either Mach number equal to one or dV equal to zero. We don't know which one, right? All we know is if dA is zero, 
then we could have either Mach number of one or dV equal to zero. In this case, what ends up happening is just dV goes to zero. It means the velocity just doesn't change at that point, right? Uh, we're, we're not gonna reach a Mach number of one here because we're, we're diverging away from it if the incoming flow is subsonic. Um, it just means dV would be zero there, okay? Now, if we instead had the incoming flow supersonic, let me zoom back in again. If the incoming flow was supersonic, what would end up happening is this case. The dV would be greater than zero, it means the Mach number is increasing. So what ends up happening here is the Mach number starts increasing. Again, we diverge away from a Mach number of one. We're not approaching a Mach number of one. Instead, what would happen right at this point, dA equals zero, you would just get dV is equal to zero. It's just not going to reach a Mach number one because we're always diverging away from it. Okay. Um, let me now focus on this case. So, so this, uh, so this particular case where we're just increasing the area, that's not going to get us to a Mach number of one. It's just what ends up happening is just dV is equal to zero at that point. Now let's consider this case. Okay. So now if it's subsonic coming in, then what'll happen with the de decreasing area is the Mach number will actually increase and it'll approach a Mach number one. And it's very possible we could reach a Mach number one right here at the minimum area. We, we can approach it, okay? So what can happen here when D, dA is equal to zero is it could either be, we could either reach a Mach number one or we could reach dV is equal to zero. We don't always reach a Mach number one. Um, just because you have a minimum area here doesn't mean that you suddenly reach a Mach number one. It could just mean that dV is equal to zero. Okay, I always like to use the example, you know, you go get a soda from McDonald's or something like that and you're drinking it through a straw. When you crimp the straw, you're creating a little minimum area there. It doesn't mean suddenly that the liquid you're drinking reaches a Mach number one. If it did, we'd all be dead. We'd never be able to drink soda from a straw from McDonald's ever again because um, it would just shoot right through your head. Um, that's pretty gruesome. I probably shouldn't have said that. But anyway, um, just because you make a minimum area doesn't mean you reach a Mach number of one. But if you have a Mach number of one, it must occur at a minimum area, okay? So it's possible in this situation to reach a Mach number one. It doesn't guarantee we're gonna reach a Mach number one, but it, it's possible it could occur. Similarly, if we had an incoming flow that's supersonic, as we decrease that area, then the Mach number will go down. And again, we're approaching a Mach number of one. So for an incoming supersonic flow, it's possible that we could reach a Mach number of one, or maybe just the, the velocity doesn't change at that point of inflection. Okay, so, uh, so this kind of system, we could reach a Mach number of one. This one, we can't. We, we always diverge from a Mach number one. This one, we could. We're not guaranteed we'll reach a Mach number of one, but it's, it's the only system that would get us to a Mach number of one. And then what ends up happening when you, uh, let's, let's say you do reach a Mach number of one right here. Let's, Let's pretend we reach a Mach number one. What ends up happening further downstream? Well, that gets a lot more complicated. That depends on the downstream boundary conditions, namely the pressure. And it's something we're gonna talk about in a future uh, lecture. I'm not gonna talk about it here, but at this point, we can't really say what's gonna happen downstream. It could go subsonic, it could go supersonic. It all depends on the, the downstream pressure boundary conditions. So we'll hold off on talking about that part. Okay, um, let me just briefly talk about this case. This case, again, uh, dA is zero. It's just kind of an inflection point here. What'll end up, what we'll show later is um, this kind of a situation will always correspond to dV is equal to zero at that point. You won't get a Mach number of one there. And the reason for that is because it turns out there's, there's actually, if you have a mo um, uh, Mach number one, it'll have to occur at a minimum area. And since this, this area is not a minimum. You can see that it's still decreasing. It, it will never be a Mach number of one. It it's always has to occur at a minimum area. And that's something that we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so, so the only way that we'll reach a Mach number of one is if we have a minimum area. Um, we're not guaranteed that you'll reach a Mach number of one, but if you're going to have a Mach number of one, it has to occur there. And again, just a reminder, the reason we know that is because if the Mach number is one, 
then dA has to be zero. And the only way that we can get to a Mach number one is by making it a minimum area here. If, uh, if the area is a minimum, so if dA is zero, it doesn't mean that you reach a Mach number one. You could just have dV equal to zero. So it's not um, an if and only if statement. It's, it, 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 um, it can, it's, it, it's not symmetric forwards and backwards, okay? So it's very important to remember that. If you have a Mach number one, it will occur at a minimum area. If you have a minimum area, it doesn't mean you reach a Mach number one. You could just have dV equal to zero. And it all just comes from looking at that expression. So getting back to the, the rocket nozzle design, let me go back up to this picture. The way these rocket nozzles are designed, and you can't really see it that well from this photograph, but they always go through a minimum area. So you'll have like your tank where the fuel is and then it ignites and then these nozzles are designed like this. So the flow actually goes this way. And this tank would be at stagnation conditions, right? So it basically it's a large tank, almost zero velocity. And if you wanna to get to supersonic flow at the exit, you have to go through a minimum area. And so this, this is a minimum area, this is a throat and the area is small enough to reach a Mach number one, and it, the Mach, so it'll be subsonic up here. It'll reach a Mach number one at the throat, and then the downstream conditions, typically the, the pressure is low enough that you would reach supersonic conditions here, and then they open up the area in order to get higher velocities. Um, but the, what happens downstream of that throat depends a lot on what, depends on what the pressure is doing. So um, again, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But these kinds of nozzle designs where you go through a minimum area, those are called DeLaval nozzles. You'll hear that name, DeLaval nozzles, or converging diverging nozzles. Converging, you can see the converging part here, and then diverging here. DeLaval was, a, was the one that really kind of came up with this um, nozzle design. I'll, I'll go off on a little tangent here, but he was, back in the day of steam turbines, people were trying to find ways to get more um, more power out of their turbines and people knew that if you had a decreasing so what they would do is they would direct steam at uh, basically kind of paddles that would cause the turbines to spin and people knew that if they decreased the area they could get higher velocities impacting those paddles and it would cause it to spin but they always came up against a limit they couldn't find a way to to go you know get more power out of these rotating um, steam turbines and DeLaval actually, uh, I don't know how, maybe stumbled on it, maybe had some insight, but anyway, he designed a converging diverging kind of nozzle and his flows ended up going supersonic. So with just the converging nozzle, the highest velocity or the highest Mach number you would get out of that converging nozzle would be a Mach number of one because it'll occur at a minimum area. And, uh, but when, it had, when DeLaval designed his, he had a converging diverging area and his flows came out supersonic and so he ended up getting higher velocities coming out and uh, getting more power out of his steam turbines. So people um, name this converging diverging nozzle design after him. They're called the lava nozzles. We'll talk a lot more about this kind of design um, in a couple more lectures. Okay, so what I want you to get so far from what we've talked about is the fact that the behavior changes a lot, whether or not you're dealing with subsonic or supersonic flows. You know, if the area decreases for a subsonic flow, the velocity and Mach number will increase. If the area increases for a subsonic flow, then the velocity and Mach number will decrease. But for a supersonic flow, decreasing area decreases the Mach number and velocity. Increasing the area increases the Mach number and velocity. So very different behavior. And if you have a Mach number somewhere uh, if you have a sonic Mach number somewhere in the flow, it must occur at a minimum area. It'll be this case here, a minimum area. It must occur at that minimum area. If you have a minimum area in the flow, it doesn't mean that you reach a Mach number of one. You could just have dV equal to zero. If dA is zero, it could be dV is zero. But if a Mach number of one occurs anywhere, it has to be where dA is equal to zero. Okay. So you might ask yourself, well, what does that minimum area have to be? You know, if, if uh, you're drinking water, um, soda through a straw at McDonald's and you decrease the area, how do you, you know, you, you don't want to decrease it enough that you're worried that suddenly you're going to make it supersonic. You're now, now you're going to be afraid to drink water or soda from a straw. 
Um, so how would you know what that minimum area has to be? Well, we can actually calculate it. And you can combine conservation of mass with our isentropic relations. The, the derivation is, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not going to go through the derivation here. I don't think you need to know all the details of that. If you want to know, look at my book style notes where it's all typed up. I just want you to know that this expression comes from conservation of mass combined with um, the isentropic relations. You combine them all together and you'll end up with this expression here. It's kind of a complicated look at, looking expression. But what this expression says is this is the area at that Mach number. You'll see the Mach numbers in there a couple of times. If you have this Mach number at that area, then the area you need to get down to to reach sonic conditions is A star. So remember, the starred notation here indicates at a Mach number of 1. So this is the area when you reach a Mach number of 1. So the, kind of, the idea is this. So let's say you have some flow in a pipe, and we know the area there is A, and we have the Mach number there. So the A star would be what area you'd have to decrease down to And I'm just drawing this kind of imagine this is the area you'd have to get down to to reach a Mach number of 1. And it doesn't matter whether the flow, the Mach number up here is subsonic or supersonic. There's some area eventually that you'd have to get down to to reach a Mach number of 1. That's the A star. Okay. Now you might ask yourself, well, what happens if I change? my? What if I go smaller than A star? What happens then? Well, what will end up happen then, happening then is you'll still have a Mach number of 1 here. So even if you make it, let's say you have this Mach number in that area, you calculate your A star, but let me make the area even smaller, what happens in that situation. You'll still have a Mach number of 1 there, it'll still be an A star, but what'll happen is the upstream conditions will have to change. It'll, in order to have an isentropic flow, um, the upstream conditions have to change. Something has to change because it, it's just not possible to have an area smaller than A star here. Um, because it'll be a minimum area. It's got to be a Mach number of 1. So what will end up happening is the upstream Mach number would have to change in that case. It'll modify itself such that the, the new area that you've shrunk down to becomes the new A star. And um, so that's what ends up happening in that case. Okay, so anyway, getting back to this expression, if we go ahead and plot it, it'll look like this picture over here. A over A star as a function of Mach number, and you'll see that at a Mach number of 1, so a couple things I'll highlight from this picture, but at a Mach number of 1, A over A star is equal to 1. That makes sense, right? Because at a Mach number of 1, you're already at A star, so it'll be A star over A star. It's just 1. But you'll notice that there are actually two values of Mach number. So if I have A over A star of 3, you'll see I have a subsonic Mach number that corresponds to that and a supersonic Mach number that corresponds to that. So what's going on there? Well, remember from our picture up here, um, when we kind of went through this scenario, whether or not the flow is subsonic or supersonic coming in, if you decrease the area, you eventually reach a Mach number of 1. So this is just saying that if you have um, this area in a subsonic Mach number, you can calculate what the A star is for that. and uh, and then here's the if you have a supersonic flow coming in at a particular area, you know this is the A star for that. It's, it doesn't matter whether the incoming flow is subsonic or supersonic. If you decrease the area, you will approach a Mach number of one. Okay, so this would this just tells us what that minimum area has to be to reach that Mach number of one. Okay, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to say about that. Now, one, one thing that you'll see in, in a later lecture is, again, when we start talking about converging, diverging nozzles, if I tell you that this is, a, you know, our A star, you might ask yourself, um, and, and then I give you, let, let's say I just give you the geometry. The, the, you know, I give you the throat area, which we'll call um, A star, and then, and then I'll give you kind of an exit area here, A, let's call it A sub E. And I can calculate a sub e over a star, right? And let's say it's the value of 3 like I have here. And then I want to know, is it going to be a subsonic flow at the exit? Or is it going to be a supersonic flow at the exit? How do I determine which one it is? 
you need more information to figure that out. And the additional information that we need is actually the, the pressure condition. We need to know something about what the pressure is back here. This is what we call the back pressure. So if it's stagnation conditions up here, it's this pressure difference that drives the flow. It pushes the fluid through that converging diverging nozzle. Um, we need to know what that ratio is to figure out whether the flow is going to be subsonic or supersonic um, at the exit. So we need that additional information to figure out what's going to happen. Okay. We'll get to that in a later lecture. But for now, I just want you to be aware that for, if you're given the area at a particular Mach number, we can determine, and whether or not it's subsonic or supersonic, we can determine what that minimum area needs to be to reach a Mach number of one. Okay. All right, and uh, this equation is a little more complicated. Again, if you're gonna you know, calculate this, if, if you're given the Mach number, it's it's tedious, but you can get A over A star pretty easily. But if you try to work in reverse, if you're given A over A star and you're trying to find the Mach number, that's a hard, a, that's a hard thing to calculate on your, um, on your calculator, especially a simple calculator. Um, you have to do kind of a root finding method. So you can certainly do that um, if you have the right kind of calculator. Uh, if not, you can use tables, isentropic tables. Let me show you what these tables look like. I mentioned this in, in a previous lecture. Let's see if I can find it. Here it is. So here's our, this is our formula sheet for ME309. Let me go to the very top so you can see it's the ME comprehensive formula sheet. If you go to the very end of that formula sheet, you'll see these tables. So these are isentropic flow tables for air. And you'll see here Mach number. This is our stagnation pressure ratio, P over P naught, T over T naught, rho over rho naught, so pressure, temperature, density. And you'll see one here for A over A star. And so if we're given a value of A over A star and we want to find what the Mach number is corresponding to that, you could go here. Let's say the, the A over A star is equal to 3. So I can look here and I see, oh, the our corresponding subsonic Mach number would be somewhere like 0.19, for example, somewhere between these two values. And then if I wanted to find the corresponding supersonic value, I'd have to scroll down here. Here we are right about here. So here's the value of three for A over A star. So the corresponding supersonic value would be about 2.63, somewhere like that. Okay, so that, so you can use these tables if you, if you prefer, or if you have a good enough calculator, you could use that as well. So we have these isentropic flow tables to, just to make it convenient. They're all pre-calculated. Okay, I think that was pretty much all I wanted to talk about in this this lecture, and let me just go back and double check before I before I end. Yeah, that, that was all I really wanted to talk about. What we'll do in the next lecture is we'll actually start taking a look at flow scenarios with area changes. So first thing we'll do is just look at flows with just converging nozzles. So something that looks like this. So we'll have like a tank. We'll just have just a converging nozzle, and this will be at stagnation conditions. And we'll, we'll figure out what kind of scenarios we can get with that tank. And then after that, we'll look at tanks that have converging diverging nozzles. So we had the diverging section. Again, this will be at stagnation conditions. And we'll see what happens in that case. And you, get, you can get some very different behavior because of that uh, diverging section. And actually, before we talk about this diverging section, we're going to actually uh, make a little tangent there and talk about normal shock waves because it turns out you can get normal shock waves occurring in the diverging section of that converging diverging nozzle. But first, in the next lecture, we'll just focus on that one and see there's some interesting things that occur there, and we'll talk about that. So we'll go ahead and end the lecture there.